brief introduction of uh, Loïc Robol, uh, who comes from the Modico team at uh, University Paris Nanterre. And he's going to present the state of the art for Breton French uh, translation. It's actually a report on Sarah Almeida Barrero's master's thesis uh, with the super supervision of uh, Loïc Grobol and Melanie. So. Right, thank you very much. Um, actually, I'm doing to I'm going to do a bit of both what we did previously because not everyone here I think uh, knows about our previous work and what we tried to do uh, with Sarah and uh, the last results we got. So for some people uh, here, uh, there will be old news and. I'm sorry for that, um, but I think it's uh, interesting to see where we come from. So previously. Uh, and that was, I think, about uh, two years ago now. Uh, that was the stages of what machine translation looked like for Breton. So mostly we had the Apertium system uh, from Francis Tyers, which was rule-based. And you can see here the, an example of a translation that it could produce, which is, of course, not a good translation, but maybe a useful translation. Francis described it as a gisting translation system. So not something that will give you a translation, but something that will help someone that does not speak Britain at all, a vague idea of what uh, is being spoken about. And the second example uh, was the state of the art in neural machine translation, a huge model uh, supposed to deal with 100 languages from a team at Facebook, including low resource languages and including Breton, um, or at least they claimed uh, that it did. And as you can see, uh, it does not, absolutely not. So the state of the art system using uh, neural networks, huge computing resources and so on, and the whole power of Facebook did far worse than the little rule-based system that our friend Fran uh, did for us. So that was absolutely not good. And there were also some efforts from the Opus team at the University of Helsinki uh, for doing a machine translation model for uh, multiple Celtic languages. So mixing together Breton and Welsh, and uh, but also uh, Gaelic languages. And uh, of course, they are all part of the same <clears throat> language family, but they have widely different uh, grammar and writing system. So maybe mixing them together was not such a good idea. Uh, and certainly publishing the models in their state um, was not a very good idea at all. So that's what, what we had about two years ago. And so what, why? What was happening? Because uh, on Opus, uh, which is the original work of the team that did the last two models, um, it seemed that there were a lot of Breton data. So it was claimed that there were uh, 1.6 million sentences for the Breton French uh, per and 1.1 million for Breton English per, which is that's not a low resource language. With that kind of numbers, you could do a very decent translation system. So what's happening? Uh, what was happening was that most of the Breton data came from three corpuses, all built from parallel corpus mining. So the idea is you train a kind of language agnostic sentence representation model uh, using a small parallel corpus that you know is of good quality. And then you look in uh, monolingual data for sentences that have the same representation. So basically you are trying to match sentences that are not translation of one another, but are similar enough that they could be. Because something that someone has said at one point in Breton, probably someone has also said at one point in French or something similar enough. So that should work. Um, and on Opus, we will come back to that uh, later. The huge problem is that the representation for Breton were, were very poorly aligned. So this process of finding parallel sentences was completely flawed and with a reported error rate of 85%, which shouldn't have been a surprise because uh, this model was trained using a corpus that is not well, what well, well, that is small and also mostly poorly aligned. So you can see an example here of the open subtitle corpus that was used to train this parallel sentence extraction model. And you can see that it's not a parallel corpus, right? So the open subtitles is film subtitles. So the idea is you take the same film in uh, subtitle in different languages and match sentences at uh, the same timestamp. 
But of course, like in the first case, sometimes uh, the uh, replicas are not as split differently. Sometimes, like in the third case, they are they could be uh, the thing said uh, at the same time, but are not a direct translation. And in some case, they are completely alignment mistake, like in the two other way, you can see that Pakistan or Tony are just not in the uh, parallel sentences. So this is a bad corpus. So if you use this to find parallel sentences in other corpora, obviously it will fail and it will fail very badly. And that's what happened. And, but, that should have been, uh, someone should have checked this, right, and put a warning. But very clearly, no one actually did. No speaker of Breton has ever been involved in the development of either these data sets or these translation models at any point. And we will talk about evaluation later this afternoon, and that's what's, why it's very important that we uh, involve ourselves. But actually, as you can see, no one, even a non-speaker of Breton has been involved because these are all very obvious mistakes that has to, should have been caught uh, earlier. Um, some other crimes uh, I wanted to talk about. So we've seen GPT uh, do, Melanie uses GPT-4, which is a bit better, but uh, what I, I had access to was GPT-3, which is better uh, to translate uh, from Breton to French at least. Uh, so this is quite decent uh, translation of at least this sentence. But if you try to do it in the uh, French to Breton uh, direction, you can see that uh, it does not work. It does some kind of weird calc uh, of English and invent words. And if you try to ask it for another translation, it, it will definitely try to do that for you. And it will also fail and fail and fail again and again to provide a decent translation from French to Breton. So it looks like Breton, it's Breton, ish and it's not completely wrong but it is wrong uh, you can't use it as a translation model and uh, i don't want to talk about this so much so i will just pass but someone is using uh chat yeah chat gpt to make it mod okay this is uh horrible so what we try to do is uh, take a little help from uh, Phil Linguistics and working with Melanie is a huge boon for uh, NLP technologies so uh, she presented our earlier, and what we did was take uh, the glosses in our, not so much for the syntactic content, but for the translation that we have, because this is not only a syntactic notation, it's also a corpus of translation, a parallel corpus that we can use to train a uh, machine translation model. So the first time we did that using the, the same extraction, uh, so that was uh, one and a half year ago, I think, uh, we got about 5,000 sentences, which is an order of magnitude less than the corpus from Office Public Raison that was used by Francis Tyers to test Apertium. Um, so it seems like it's not a lot. Uh, 5,000 sentences in machine translation amounts to practically nothing. So did all this work of linguistic extraction data and so on uh was it all for nothing and no surprisingly it was not so let's try something let's compare what a petium does what uh, this bad model does out of the box let's try to see what this model that pretends to translate from breton does if you trained it also on the office public apresonic uh, corpus so you give it a little crash course in breton so it pretended to speak breton it didn't let's give it some more data and then let's give it some good data from the arbre uh, corpus because the office public apresonic corpus for those of you who are familiar with the work of translation done through the office is very specific right it's mostly like administrative texts uh town websites, uh, that kind of things. So it's not like general purpose language. And it has a very uh, limited coverage of the grammar of Breton. For instance, uh, you will find almost no past tense sentences, which is, of course, a problem if you try to do.
give me a number. Is that the one from the webcam? Okay. Uh, we, we're getting feedback from somewhere. I don't know where. Okay, but it seems that they can hear me. So let's leave it at this from that. So we evaluate an, a private data set that uh, was made from for the office to evaluate their own translator that I won't talk about because they're don't share it publicly apart from a little interface on their website. So good for them, but I can do anything uh, scientific with that. So what the evaluation, what we uh, had is uh, in terms of purely machine translation metrics, which maybe won't be uh, very, um, I mean, meaningful for some of you. Uh, so what you want, if you are not familiar, what you want to do look like is this column, the blue score, which is like the historical evaluation for a machine translation model. Uh, so upper term, and you have seen the quality of its translation is at about 24 points. This model does indeed not uh, know how to translate from Breton to French because it got less than uh, one point. You see that training it on the office public uh, corpus gets you gets us to 30 points, which is, uh, to give a reference, something that is not a good translator, but definitely a useful translator. You can use it not only to gist translation, but to pre-translate something that can be then corrected by a human. And if we add the data from ARB, we get uh, more than seven points of blue score up. Uh, from that, which is absolutely insane. This is completely crazy from a machine translation point of view to get such an improvement from such such small data. Um, and from a qualitative point of view, that's how it looks like. So all translation that doesn't work. We training on the office public corpus, so we get almost a good translation, but. Uh, not, uh, it's, uh, I don't know what to say, it's contresens because their uh, anaphora is, is wrong, but uh, we're very close. And if we add the data from R, uh, then we get a translation that's ah, not exactly good. I mean, I wouldn't, uh, if clearly a human translator wouldn't do that kind of lexical substitution, but it's at least understandable. So that's where we were. Uh, about uh, this fall, that's what I talked about with our Welsh friends at Bangor uh, in November, and that's what we did uh, uh, since then. So what we wanted to do was to have a very pointed look at what data was actually available and to control the quality of it, because there are Breton parallel data spread around the internet produced by various people of various quality and usually not uh, the quality they claim and usually not the quantity they claim. So we wanted to take the time to be sure of what people were doing and what we could gather to help us. Because if 5,000 sentences of good quality translation can bring so much improvements, surely it's worth it to take the time to see what we can get uh, for the other data sources. So on Opus right now, this is what's available. Um, it has changed a lot since the statistics I gave earlier, and we do not know why yet, because we just got in touch with the Opus team uh, in Torino uh, two weeks ago, and we will try to work together in the future, but for now, we're just looking at what they uh, make available on their website and trying to make sense of it. So you can see that the corpora that were badly aligned are still there, but with far less uh, sentence pairs. So they got from a million and a half to a few dozen thousand sentence pairs. And it's not clear how 
how they got down from that. Did they do a new extraction or something? It's not documented, so we can't know. Uh, we still have the corpus of the office, which I will talk about in a moment. We have some corpora that um, are from translation of computer system interfaces. We still have open subtitles and some um, other corpora. So what's clearly unusable is the open subtitle corpus, which has not changed, and it's still a very bad parallel corpus. Some data in there is good, and we could try to scrape it and manually uh, line it. I'm not fully convinced that it's more efficient to do this than to actually translate new sentences from scratch that we can control the quality and the coverage of. This, uh, from this poor alignment, uh, there is still the same inner, inheritance system that produced this um, power, mind parallel corpora, so uh, wiki matrix and this one. Uh, and since they are still uh, inheriting uh, the alignment from open subtitle, they are still bad. And you sh still shouldn't use them because they are absolutely not parallel corpora. So there is still the same problem on Opus that uh, par parallel corpora of Britain are supposedly distributed that are very bad quality. And if someone who doesn't want to take the time to look at everything in details, just trust the producer of this uh, data, they will make bad translations. Uh, some other corpus are, corpora are hard to use. The QED corpus uh, is not fully translated. So that was a huge disappointment for us because when we try to look at it, at first we looked at the first, uh, I don't know, uh, 100 sentences and we were, we were very happy with them. Like there are long sentences, good translation and so on. But if you just go down after that, they are just not translated. So you just have an English uh, sentence instead of the Breton one because the work has not been finished. Uh, and this is why you should check all the data and not just a sample. Uh, the other corpora, the translation of computer system interfaces, uh, are noisy and domain specific, which is a shame because they are quite uh, large. Um, sadly, not all of this, okay, most of this is not sentences, but just pieces of interface like click here or uh, enter your name or that kind of stuff. Sometimes it's useful, sometimes not. Mostly you get very specific lexicon. And it's also not fully translated and you get a lot of noise from email addresses from people and uh, HTML tags spread in there. So using it actually degrades the quality of the training, even if it does bring uh, some data. So what's left on Opus? So the Office Publica Brezone Corpus, the Wikimedia Corpus, which uh, we're still not completely sure who did that and how. And that's a web corpus, uh, which is mostly a crowdsourced um, parallel corpus. Uh, so that's web is an association, I guess, uh, crowdsourcing translation um, in a lot of languages. And this is good quality, so we can use that. So this is already this is already an improvement in the data we had, and six uh, thousand sentence pairs is nothing to uh, frown upon. But uh, most of the data in Opus is still bad for us. And there are data that is not on Opus. <coughs> so we have the Bread Hidau Sentence Bank, which is Breton Welsh translation, which is very nice. And uh, I hope we can use it later for cross lingual application between these sister languages. But so far, it's not useful for us because we want to mostly to do Breton to French translation. And various data from the office, so something they call Corpus de France Bilingue Aligné, which you can find somewhere on their website, lost in an old uh, page. Uh, something that do distribute now on GitHub, which is supposedly what they train their translator on, uh, with a number of sentences that is suspiciously close to the, what they distributed already, and we will talk about that in a second. Uh, our own corpus of 5,000 sentences and the Breton KEB uh, corpus with translation now from Melanie. So we can be sure of the quality of that. Some words on the office corpora. So the office released several corpora at various times, various places with unclear overlap. So the original release uh, extracted from them uh, by Francis Tyers 
uh, in 2009. The currently available version on Opus, which, uh, and this Corpus de Phrase Bilingue, should have put the number, so about 4,000 uh, sentences. And the first two share about 90% uh, of their content. We're not sure why, where the other data comes from. Like, this is not an, the second one is not a new release of data. It's some of the old data, but not all of the old data and some new data as well. It doesn't really make sense to us. And of course, we are talking with the office is uh, not always very easy. The last one uh, is apparently completely new, completely different from the others. So that's good for us. Uh, altogether, this accounts for about uh, 71,000 uh, sentence per. So a clear improvement uh, from a quantitative point of view. From a qualitative point of view, not so much. It's still kind of the same genre. Uh, so it's not all that helpful. But hey, we won't uh, throw on more data. And now the current extraction from uh, Kunert, which is our uh, uh, project for, for, for getting syntax out of our has about two twelve thousand sentences, so uh, we more than double the amount of data we extracted from our uh, glosses. That's also very good. Our is still evolving. Many glosses uh, are still unexploited. For instance, in the extraction currently, we have a lot of places where Melania has put alternatives in the glosses. So one work could be used instead of another, and we lead to another. This is gl classic uh, linguistic gloss formatting. That is to be dealt with later in the extraction process. So there's still more to get. And of course, are we still evolving? So Melanie is adding sentences uh, continuously. Maybe at some point, other people will also be contributing to that and adding more sentences. That would be wonderful. So yes, this is uh, not going back. Ultimately, what would help uh, and what uh, is on the table for me is to store glosses in more structured form than just wiki tables because the extraction process is very costly, as we have seen. It has helped Melanie uh, format um, wiki tables in a more structured and more principled way, but it's still a lot of work to make wiki tables and it's still a lot of work to extract data from tables. So what we want to do ideally is have a very simple gloss format that would generate both the wiki table uh, graphic uh, format and stuff we can uh, use uh, in NLP application. Getting, we should get in touch about that. <laughs> and also, I really want to find a way to take a grammatical example. Uh, so, sentences that Melanie put in the grammar uh, where native speakers said, No, I, I can't say this. This would maybe, th this looks like it could be Breton, but it's actually not. I can't resist this agrammatical. And using these negative data points would be a huge boom. Uh, also, an evolution in machine translation, because no one does that. So, hey, maybe we can actually bring something to, not only to Breton, but to the larger machine translation community. Uh, so, we have about uh, 20 uh, percent the numbers are wrong, um, About, but 20 is right. About 20% increase of uh, quality per sentences extract from our data scrapping. And it's really scrapping, like taking the data that's there and taking painful time to see what's good and what we can use uh, in the last six months. So we had a lot of disappointment. So many of these data sets, as you have seen, are still released and used without any control. And this has significantly delayed training new models. We were hoping to maybe take a few months looking at data and then train new fancy shiny models. And actually we spent most of our time just looking at data and trying to format it. So uh, yeah, but we do have to do better by working directly with the Opus team. We were very happy to make contact with them. Uh, and they are apparently very willing to find a way to involve speaking communities uh, in quality control efforts. So way to speakers of a language to go to Opus and uh, check the quality of the data that's here directly and say, yes, this is uh, Breton. Yes, this is not Breton. This is a good translation. This is not. Um, and at some point, the Opus team could use it to uh, indicate on their website uh, that some of their data are low quality or even remove them completely from the platform. Because right now they are operating on a trust, trust basis. So if you send them data and claiming, oh, I did this corpus, they just blindly trust you. They don't have the time to trust check everything. 
And this has also made very clear the need for a trusted quality control mechanism, both for model and for data with wide coverage test data. Again, something on that uh, this afternoon that can be scrapped in order to avoid uh, train hacking. So if the models can scrape out data from the web evaluation, they can cheat on and report higher number that uh, they really uh, have. Uh, and we'll talk about that later as well. And result, this is fully hot from the press. The model is still training as we speak, but uh, <laughs> I, I took the last, uh, the latest uh, state of it. So we do have some numbers. Um, using the new version of Arbre and also the new version from the office corpus, we get small improvements uh, from a quantitative point of view. So this is this last line that you want to look at. So about two points of blue score. That's not much, but that's already something. Um, that's not much given the amount of new data, like bringing the new data from out the first time brought us a huge improvement. This is not so huge, but it's still very good. I mean, this is, not, yeah, we, we do have something to be happy about. And um, yeah, we can to take a look uh, at the translation in a minute, if you want. So try to see what these new models are doing. From what I can see right now, uh, the translation seems more accurate in general. But uh, an artifact of the training data, I think, uh, the model is much likely to translate only part of the source. So just take uh, a part of the original sentence, translate it very good, very like perfectly, but leave out some part. So if you say, uh, I was going to the beach uh, yesterday morning. It would just translate the I was going to the beach part and leave the rest. And I suspect because of the addition of the tattoo by data and the new office public data, which has shorter sentences and also lots of non sentences. So just like titles of stuff or uh, it biases the models towards producing smaller translation. Um, so I guess we need longer and more complex sentence. Let's do that, please. Uh, please work with us and provide us with very complex literary Breton. Um, and also I can see that there is a lot of variability in the results at different points in the training process. And the details of training are very finicky. So changing only small parameter that shouldn't change anything can have huge uh, impacts on the results. So I think in the next step, we should also take the time to actually refine the machine learning and natural language processing side uh, of things to be sure that we do have a stable training pipeline to evaluate this data. At first, what I did was just take the first model that was off the shelf and train it because we had data and we wanted a translation model that we could use right now. I wasn't expecting so good results. And we've been uh, building upon this foundation for two years now. I think it's maybe time to go back and yeah, take the time to do it the right way. And I think that's all for me. And I think I finished in advance because as usual, I spoke, spoke far too quick. So we have a lot of time for, so we have a lot of time for questions.